I'm Alice Loxton, and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things royal history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. You've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount for History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details in the video description and use the code REALROYALTY, all one word, when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Anne Boleyn, the wife of Henry VIII, awoke in the royal apartments at the Tower of London. Her ladies-in-waiting made their final preparations. Anne left her chambers at a little before eight o'clock to face her destiny. Awaiting her at the end of this short journey was an expert executioner, famed for his skills with a razor-sharp blade. He just arrived from France, summoned by the king as a last minute act of mercy for a wife for whom he'd risked everything, but whom he ultimately believed had betrayed him. The lives of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn have been cloaked in historical myth, romantic legend, cliches and half-truths. Henceforth, my heart shall be dedicated to you alone. Their turbulent relationship continues to spark fierce debate. I am entirely innocent of all these accusations. Ah! Are we retracing the footsteps of this extraordinary couple? Piecing together the fragments of evidence that have survived to discover what brought Henry and Anne together and what ultimately tore them apart. We all know how this tragedy plays out, but how well do we know its leading characters? This is the story of Henry and Anne. My journey begins in the Kent countryside, in search of Anne Boleyn. Her symbol was a falcon, used to extol her purity, her chastity, and her grace. There's a popular myth that Anne was from lowly origins, that she was a bit of an upstart, but that's far from the truth. This is Hever Castle, the seat of the Berlins. It's Anne Boleyn's childhood home where she spent many formative years. Here her parents, Thomas and Elizabeth, brought up the three children who made it to adulthood. The eldest was Mary, who fleetingly later would be a mistress to Henry VIII. Probably the youngest was George, who was a great companion to Anne, a bright young girl who would one day be queen. Her father, Thomas Boleyn, was a member of the King's Council and Henry VIII's ambassador to France. Anne was well educated and from a wealthy, privileged family. The story goes that she was a free spirit, someone who was sparky, intelligent and fun-loving. But this is based as much on rumour and speculation as any hard evidence. It's so hard to get a sense of the real Anne Boleyn. We have a few letters, but we don't have any diaries. We don't really have any of the sort of things that we need to get a grasp on what she was really like. And yet, when you come to a place like this, where she actually lived, one has this incredible sense that the veil between past and present has grown thin, and only time, and not space, separates us from Anne. Fortunately, a few telling pieces of evidence have survived, which give us a rare glimpse into 
This is one of the few surviving possessions of Anne at Hever. It's a book of hours. It's a beautifully illustrated and illuminated manuscript book of prayers and devotions. And these things were immensely popular in Europe at the time. And what's really exciting about it is that Anne held it. There's something of a real thrill to be touching it. It was probably one of her most treasured possessions. What this reminds us is the importance of faith at this time. It literally determined people's hours. Religion marked out their days. We often have an idea of Anne in our heads that's of her being ambitious and worldly and perhaps something of a vixen. And yet, this is one of her few belongings that we know and can identify. It reminds us that Anne is pious and religious. But what's even more thrilling about it is that Anne herself wrote in it. It's an inscription in French and it says, Le temps viendra, je am Berlin. The time will come, I am Berlin. The time will come, I am Berlin. Now we don't know when she wrote this. We don't know exactly what she meant by it, but it seems immensely prophetic and powerful. It's on a page where there's a picture of Christ being raised above the earth and then there are these little heads at the bottom that look like people coming up out of the grave. So perhaps this refers to the day of judgment. Many people in the 16th century thought that they were living in the end times, the last days before the second coming of Christ. But perhaps there's a more earthly explanation. I wonder if Anne thought that she was destined for greatness. All our doings being ordered by thy government. Even if she was ambitious, Maybe Anne could Jesus. never have imagined that her destiny Jesus would lie Christ with the most powerful man in the land, a married man. Amen. The king. We all think we know Henry VIII, but actually what we conjure up is Henry in the last decade of his life when he's obese and savage and ruthless and cruel. But he wasn't always like that. In fact, when he first came to the throne and for the first 20 or so years of his reign, he was noted, first of all, for being really good looking. He had auburn hair, he was very tall, he was six foot two when the average height was five foot seven and a half. And he was so good at sport that everyone commented on it. He surpassed all the archers of his guard. He was a fine jouster, a capital horseman. To see him play tennis, one Venetian ambassador commented, was the prettiest thing in the world. <laughs> that Venetian ambassador also said, perhaps he had a crush, that he had a round face so very beautiful that it would become a pretty woman. But the thing that was most surprising to me, coming across this young Henry, was that he was also well-loved. He was considered to be kind. The ambassador said that he was affable and gracious, a man who harmed no one. Erasmus said that he was a man of gentle friendship and gentle in debate. He acts more like a companion than a king. Henry was evidently very charismatic when he spoke to you, it was like the sun was shining. As a king and a man, he seemed to have few flaws. But Henry would become tormented by his failure to perform the most basic, yet most important task of any monarch. It would put him on a collision course with Anne, and together they would change England forever. Henry VIII wasn't born to be king. He'd come to the throne after the death of his father, Henry VII, and only
only because his older brother, Arthur, had died suddenly at the age of just 15. Within months of becoming king, Henry married his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. They were crowned together. But with marriage came a huge pressure. Now he needed to produce an heir to secure the dynasty for the next generation. And not just one, he needed an heir and a spare, as his brother's death had indicated. Henry would be married to Catherine for over 20 years. And for much of that time, they were happy together. But they were beset by a devastating series of miscarriages and stillbirths. When a son Henry was born, he died 52 days later. Mary would be the only child to survive. Most people at the time saw little value in a female heir, as she would likely end up marrying a European prince, allowing England to be dominated by a foreign power. And France and Spain were a constant threat throughout Henry's reign. So siring a legitimate heir became Henry's overriding obsession. It was an obsession that would manifest itself in Henry's relationship with God, by whom he believed he had been anointed king. This lack of a surviving legitimate male heir suggested to Henry VIII that he was being punished by God. And he suspected the reason was that he had married his brother's widow. And scriptures backed him up in this. In Leviticus it says, in chapter 18, verse 16, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. And chapter 20, verse 21 says, If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Henry's theological experts assured him that childless, in this instance, actually meant no sons. While England waited for an heir to the throne, the teenage Anne had crossed the Channel and was embracing all that Europe had to offer. After some time in the Netherlands, her father found her role in the French court which would become a defining influence in her life. Little is known of Anne's nine years on the continent, and yet much is always made of it. It certainly was a formative period of her life. It was the period when she was educated, and people in the 16th century, and today, have speculated in a kind of prurient, nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of way, that at the French court particularly, she learned the art of love. I want to see for myself how Anne's time in France shaped her character. I'm travelling to the Chateau de Bois, one of the palaces where the French king, Francis I, held his court. I can only imagine what the young Anne must have felt when she first arrived here. I've never been here before, and it's really exciting. Anne would be a lady-in-waiting to the cultured and pious French queen, Claude. They didn't do things by halves, did they? Look at this place. My word. It was the most fashionable court in Europe, reflected in its spectacular architecture. This is an extraordinary sort of Renaissance style. You've got the little classical statues up the top here and all these columns and this amazing spiral staircase. It's so incredibly beautiful, this staircase. It would have been such an extraordinary time for Anne when she was here because she was here with Claude of France, who herself was a real patron of the arts. Francis I, her husband, was so much a fan of the Renaissance that he invited Leonardo da Vinci to France and he was installed just down the road. So there's every chance that Anne might have met him. So basically Anne would have been surrounded by this world of intellectual endeavour and artistic endeavour. It must have been such an exciting place to be. I'm out of breath now. Anne came of age in France. One observer later wrote 
that no one would ever have taken her to be English by her manners, but a native-born French woman. What might Anne have learnt at this court? The first thing, of course, is French, uh, because French was a very important uh, language at that time. It was something like the English today in the northern uh, courts of Europe. We just know that she must have been at some very important events, such as when the English ambassadors came to France in 1518 or at the field of the Close of Gold, because she must there have played an important role as an interpreter between the English and the French. She received a European education and she was uh, really different from the young ladies who just stayed in England. She also saw firsthand what was required to fulfill the essential role of a queen. Her mistress Claude gave birth to seven children in eight years, including three sons, something Henry and Catherine could only dream of. Claude was also extremely pious, so it's unlikely that her court was a hotbed of promiscuity. Cedric, one of the things that's often said about Anne's time in France, with probably little evidence from what you've said so far, is that there's kind of this idea that somehow she's learned all about sex while she's been at the court. Do you think this is at all plausible? Yeah, my opinion would be that it's, it's not true, but, uh, but it may be true. We don't know, we have no evidence. I don't think there was a clear difference at that time between the court of Francis I and the court of Henry VIII. Our first surviving letter from Anne was written to her father and shows her aspirations to be accepted in the English court. Sir, I understand by your letter that you wish that I shall be of all virtuous repute when I come to court. And you inform me that the Queen will take the trouble to converse with me, which rejoices me greatly. To think of talking with a person so wise and virtuous written at five o'clock by your very humble and obedient daughter, Anna de Boulogne. We tend to think about Anne Boleyn in black and white terms. So she's either a sexual predator or she's sexually chaste. She's either pious or she's worldly. She's either innocent or sophisticated. And yet, actually, what I've learned here is that her French education, her time at the French court, was such that it prepared her to be a much more complex character than that. Her nine years on the continent transformed her from a teenage girl into an extremely desirable woman. The Anne that emerges back in England is one who's been shaped by many different influences, who is both pious and worldly who's both sophisticated and something of an innocent. She's one who can play musical instruments, who can sing, who can dance, who can speak French, who is sophisticated and witty, who's been exposed to a world of cosmopolitan glamour. And she's such an attractive prospect because, precisely because, she is so complex. The time will come, I, Anne Boleyn. In her early 20s, Anne arrived back in London. Henry held court in palaces all over the capital, and I've come to one of the few that has survived, Hampton Court. I love this place, I'm always amazed when I come here. Imagine what it must have been like for Anne when she came to court. She was joining Catherine of Aragon's court, she was a lady in waiting, and Catherine would have had a number of women serving her. And of course this meant really being a companion to Catherine, reading with her, sewing with her, being by her side as well as looking after her needs. 
There would have been perhaps 1,200 people at the court at its most, about 200 of whom were women, Catherine of Aragon's women. And of course, Catherine's court was part of the wider court, Henry's court, which was probably at most a thousand men. A Tudor court was a heady mix of politics and theatre. A court ought to be formal, ought to be serious, ought to be religious, but it also ought to be, as well as all that, it ought to be a place where people are having fun. Parties are going on where people are enjoying themselves. You don't want a court which is too serious. <laughs> Henry's court is awash with desire and love and sex. It's full of young people with lots of time on their hands um, and not much to do. In Henry's court, when people talk about love, they're often actually talking about promotion. They're often actually talking about politics. Courtly love is a game. Henry has lots of roles, but one of them is the leading courtly lover. Now, in order for him to play that role, he has to have the leading courtly woman as his object of desire, as the person he performs to. Competition for this role was intense, and maybe Anne aspired to be one of the leading players. <laughs> Henry did have mistresses, not nearly as many as the French king, but it was considered to be a normal part of court life, especially when Catherine was pregnant, because it was considered unlucky in Tudor times to have sex during pregnancy. So in 1519, for example, one of the most beautiful women at the court, Elizabeth Blount, had given birth to an illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. His surname means son of the king. And of course, this indicated to Henry that if Catherine wasn't bearing him sons, it wasn't his fault. <laughs> when Anne came to court in 1522, Henry had another mistress, someone Anne knew rather well. Henry went out to joust one day, bearing the motto, Elle mon coeur à Navarra, she has wounded my heart, which spoke of this mistress. <laughs> And the she in question was Mary, Anne's elder sister. We don't know that much about Mary. We know that she was beautiful, giddy, high-spirited. She enjoyed the trappings of court life, as Anne would later do. And we know even less about her relationship with Henry, except that it was short-lived. The risk of fleeting royal affection surely served as a warning to Anne over the coming years. It's one of the most famous love stories in history. And yet we know very little about how Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn's romance began. It's likely that Henry first noticed Anne during courtly entertainments. What is more certain is that their stories came together in early 1526 four years after Anne's arrival at court. We know this because Henry was soon writing love letters and giving her romantic gifts. One of these supposed presents is housed in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. One of the first gifts that Henry is said to have given Anne is this beautiful miniature gold whistle pendant. It's covered with foliage and it's really rather tiny. And as well as being a whistle, it also has within it a scoop for one's earwax and a pick for one's teeth. So it's all about personal hygiene. It is the sort of thing that Henry VIII might have worn on his clothing in a sort of court mask or festivity that would then be given away as a present. But above all, it tells us a message. And the message is clear. Henry is saying, if you whistle, I will come. 
It might have been just another gift from a king to a courtly love mistress, but it soon became clear from Henry's own hand that this was something far deeper. I and my heart put ourselves in your hands, begging you to recommend us to your good grace and not let absence lessen your affection. When historians study Henry and Anne, much is made of the dark political forces manoeuvring behind the scenes to unite or to separate this couple. And what is lost amongst these affairs of state is the fact that this was a very real and very passionate love affair between two individuals. These are copies of Henry VIII's letters to Anne. The originals, the manuscripts, are in the Vatican Library. They probably ended up there as part of the evidence against Henry's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. And these are quite extraordinary because they show to us these intimate moments, these private thoughts. This letter, for example, starts, Mine own sweetheart, this shall be to advertise you of the great loneliness that I find since your departing. For I assure you, you think, think that I'm longer since your departing now last than I was wont to do a whole fortnight. I think, think your, your kindness, kindness and my fervency of love caused it. For otherwise I would not have thought it possible that for so little a while it should have affected him so much. And he concludes. Darling, wishing myself especially of an evening in my sweetheart's arms, whose pretty duckies I trust shortly to kiss. Ducks is the Tudor slang for breasts. And he says, written, written by with the, the hand, hand of he who was, is, and shall be yours by his will. Henry Rex. And these sentiments are reiterated elsewhere. So here it says, for example, I would that you were in mine arms or I in yours, for I think it long since I kissed you. And to cause you yet oftener to remember me, I send you, by the bearer of this, a buck killed late last night by my own hand, hoping that when you eat of it, you will think of the hunter. But perhaps the sweetest one of all is this one, which is written in French, and he promises Anne that in the future, his heart would belong to her alone, would be dedicated to her alone, and that he desired that his body could be also. Um, and signs off again in the sweetest possible way. H and R, his initials. Autre ne cherche is not looking for any other. And then draws a love heart and puts AB in the middle. So he's like a schoolboy doodling on his exercise book. Henry loves Anne. I beg also, if at any time before this I have in any way offended you, that you would give me the same absolution that you ask, assuring you that henceforth my heart shall be dedicated to you alone. I wish my person was so too. God can do it if he pleases, to whom I pray every day to that end, hoping that at length my prayers will be heard. exactly when these letters were written, and sadly we don't have Anne's responses. But it's clear that Henry's love for her was becoming ever stronger. We know that Anne received many of these letters at Hever Castle. She was there in the late 1520s when she was suffering from sweating sickness and separated from Henry. We just don't know what she wrote back. Though you are my mistress, it has not pleased you to keep the promise you made when I was last with you. That is to say, to hear good news of you and to have an answer to my last letter. Sweating sickness was a potentially lethal disease which had spread through Tudor England, forcing Anne to stay away from the king. Because we don't have her responses, a lot has been written to fill in that gap. And there's been an assumption that somehow she was playing hard to get and manipulating him 
that he loved her and she was just playing a game. But in practice, I think, ultimately, both of them wanted to do what was right. And above all, Henry, of course, wanted to have that legitimate heir. He could only do that if Anne became his wife. There was no point in her becoming pregnant beforehand. In fact, it would have been detrimental to his cause. I think both of them decided to hold out and to wait. I don't think we should read into the absence of letters from Anne some sense that she was the one holding all the cards and Henry was just desperate to have her. I think the two of them were passionately in love but wanted to do this correctly, wanted to be right. But the stakes were high. Thomas More said, politics be king's games and for the most part played on scaffolds. And love at the Tudor court was a political affair. Anne was risking everything. And it was tough for Henry too. He now had to think the unthinkable, to divorce Catherine and marry Anne. The time will come. I, Anne Boleyn. No king had ever divorced a queen. The issue would become known as the king's great matter. A play later performed at court, no doubt with Henry's approval, made his feelings about Catherine and Anne Lord, clear. right busy at a piece of work that needs must be done. Even now is he making of a new moon. He says your old moon... It was called so The Play of the Weather the and was packed with political crazy. rhetoric, Which talking of Jupiter needing a new, tighter moon to replace his old, leaky no moon. But for this new moon, I durst lay my gown, except a few drops at her going down. You get no rain. Mocking and embarrassing Catherine, the play was a cruel statement of Henry's intent to discard a loyal wife whose only crime had been her failure to provide a male heir. Softly on the ground, though they fell on a sponge, they would give no sound. This new moon shall make a thing spring more in this while than our old moon shall, while a mile go a mile. <laughs> Henry would dramatically underestimate how difficult it would be to end this 20-year marriage legally. England was a Roman Catholic country, and on religious matters, even the king came under the authority of the Pope, and he wasn't going to play ball. I've come to see a document that testifies to the lengths that Henry would go to get Rome's permission. This document dates from 1529, and it was produced at a court that had been convened in order to examine Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon and the possibility of an annulment. This document has lots to tell us. First of all, saying that Henry's, you know, king of France and Ireland and all the other things that he claims to be. And what's really interesting about it is that Henry has gathered all the officials of the church. So it mentions Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. We've got the Archbishop of Canterbury. We've got the bishops of Ely and London and Bath and Exeter. It says that Henry feels that this matter of his marriage to Catherine has caused him a real rupture in his tranquility of his mind and his body. In other words, being married to his brother's widow in this sham marriage, as he's claiming it to be, has caused such a burden on his soul that his conscience is severely troubled. So this is the first time we really have this recognition that something has to change. And this document also demonstrates to us the lengths to which he will go to get what he wants. Among these beautiful seals, on the third from the left, we have one that has the signature up here of John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester. But not everything is quite as it seems. Rochester was a really important figure in Henry VIII's life. And yet, 
His signature here is not genuine. He later claimed that it was a forgery, that he'd never signed this document, and that he was entirely opposed to this matter of the divorce. In the end, Fisher would pay the ultimate price for his hostility to Henry and Anne, and for the lengths to which Henry would go in order to be with her. Fisher ended up, as so many others in Henry VIII's reign, on the scaffold. Now, Henry and Anne's future together seem to rest on the judgment of the Pope. Henry VIII was used to getting his own way. Blocked by the Pope from ending his marriage to Catherine so that he could marry Anne, he needed to find another solution. And help came from a source close to the king, Anne herself. I want to show you another book. This is William Tyndale's The Obedience of a Christian Man from 1528. It was a rather battered edition, but what it has to say is really important. Tyndale was a Protestant, and he argues in this book that the supreme authority is scripture, over and above the false authority of the Pope. He also adds that it's shameful for princes to be under the authority of the Pope. In other words, that kings are the highest authority in the land. It says the king is judge over all, and over him, there is no judge. What's really interesting is that Anne almost certainly gave a copy of this book to Henry. And Henry, on reading it, said, this is the book for me and all kings to read. He evidently rather liked it. And it gave Henry a solution to his dilemma. If he were the supreme religious authority, there was no need to get permission from the Pope for his divorce. And this idea that actually he was first under God played to his egotism. It was something he'd secretly suspected all along. And this is another example of the way in which this love affair was having a profound impact. This love affair was so important that it would end up changing the very faith of England. Henry broke ties with Rome, removing the Catholic Church's influence over the country. And he set about creating a new Church of England over which he would be the supreme head. It was an incredibly brave move that risked taking England to war with its Roman Catholic neighbors in Europe. Sir Henry desperately needed a powerful ally. In December 1532, he crossed the Channel with Anne to seek approval for their marriage from the French king. And they got it. They had waited for each other for seven long and difficult years. Now they had cleared a pathway to marriage. And all the evidence suggests that by the time they left Calais and returned to Dover, Henry and Anne were lovers. I've always believed that Henry and Anne were passionately in love. And if anyone should doubt their feelings for each other, there's a remarkable 500-year-old book. I don't suppose it was ever meant to be seen by anyone except Henry and Anne. I'm really excited about this. 
In all my years of studying this couple, this is the first time I've had a chance to see the real yes. thing. Will you go ahead? <laughs> So it's a stunning, it's exquisite turn of the 15th century, 16th century, probably Flemish illuminated book of ours, but really evocative and very special because it provides us with a really intimate glimpse into Henry and Anne's relationship. It contains two remarkable written entries in the hand of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. That's amazing. And this is Henry's here written in his own hand beneath, very importantly, an illumination of the flayed Christ, sometimes referred to as Man of Sorrows or Eke Homo. I think Henry is trying to portray himself by association as um, the lovesick king suffering, you know, mm. in his mm. heart. If you remember me in your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall hardly be forgotten, for I am yours forever. If you remember my love in your prayers as strongly as I adore you, then I shall scarcely be forgotten. Your Henry wrecks forever. Well, would you like to see what Anne wrote? Gosh, yes, yes. I think she chose the page very carefully. We can see here an image of the Annunciation. So Virgin Mary is being told by um, the angel that she's going to have a son and I think that this is what Anne is telling Henry. Yes. That she is the woman to provide him with the son and heir that he so desperately wanted. And then at the foot of the page, we can see she writes to Henry a couplet. By daily proof you shall me find to be to you both loving and kind. By daily proof, you shall me find to be unto you both loving and kind. Mm -hmm. Wow. These words that Henry and Anne wrote to each other remind me of wedding vows. Henry declaring that he would be hers forever and Anne promising to give the king the son and heir he desperately wanted. Now they set about making their union official. Henry brought Anne to one of his favourite palaces, the Palace of Whitehall. At the time, it was the largest palace in Europe, bigger even than the Vatican. And this map from 1680 shows something of its large extent. It shows that it had a tilt yard, tennis courts, gardens, a great hall, and many, many apartments. It would have been a glorious place for Henry and Anne to celebrate being together. Whitehall Palace was burnt to the ground in 1689. Virtually all Henry's Tudor buildings were destroyed, and what little is still left is now only seen by politicians and civil servants working in the Cabinet Office. And this is it, almost all that remains of that once mighty palace. It's a crying shame because so much of this story would have been played out here at Whitehall, including the pinnacle of Henry and Anne's romance, their marriage. Somewhere near here, in January 1533, Henry and Anne were officially married. It was a pretty private affair, there weren't many people there, and so we have few witness accounts of exactly what took place. But what we do know is that the couple would have been overjoyed because Anne was pregnant and surely this time it would be a boy. They had defied a pope and redefined a kingdom. It seemed that love had conquered all. Anne Boleyn, the wife of Henry VIII, 
awoke in the royal apartments at the Tower of London. Her ladies-in-waiting made their final preparations. The time will come. This would be an unprecedented day in the country's history. Today, England would have a new queen. The climax of a passionate love affair that had driven the king to divorce his wife. Henceforth, my heart shall be dedicated to you alone. As she emerged outside, thousands of excited spectators cheered, greeting her for the very first time. To have her as his queen, Henry had moved heaven and earth. He had annulled his previous marriage and broken ties with Rome so that he could become the supreme head of a new Church of England. But the joy of Anne's coronation wouldn't last. Less than three years later, Anne would be back in the tower for a very different reason. She would be queen for only a thousand days. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. To Christ, I commend my soul. It had taken Henry and Anne seven long and difficult years to get together. Now I'll be retracing their footsteps and piecing together the evidence to try and understand why it took just three years for their relationship to fall apart in such a tragic and violent way. Oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul. Jesus, receive my soul. Oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul. When Anne became queen, she was already pregnant. Anne had held out the promise that she would give Henry the son and heir that he needed to secure the Tudor dynasty. But Anne failed to fulfill that promise. She gave birth to a girl, Elizabeth. It was a massive disappointment. Catherine of Aragon, a loyal wife and queen for over 20 years, had already been unceremoniously discarded for being unable to deliver a son. Henry had seen this failure as a stain on his image, and image was everything in the world of the Tudors. Henry needed to be seen as a king who could continue his dynasty. This is a cartoon that was prepared by Hans Holbein, a sketch. And it is such an insight into how Henry wanted to be seen. Because for a start, he's actually taller than he was in real life. We've compared his armor with this picture and we found that actually he's been stretched but the key message of this picture is told by the shapes of Henry's body. So it forms two triangles. We've got the broad shoulders that form a triangle tapering to the waist and the splayed feet that taper also up to focus the gaze on his bulging codpiece, which his hands frame and which the several bows above. Because this picture is all about masculinity and virility and fertility and potency. It's no wonder that we think of Henry as this man of lusts, when in actual fact he had trouble siring an heir, because this picture tells us what to think. That's why there are so many copies of this picture, because if you were a courtier who had any nous at all, you'd get yourself a copy of this picture to show that you were on message. Henry and Anne's marriage came under intense pressure from the very beginning. England's future depended on their ability to reproduce. A song composed for Anne's coronation made the new queen's duties explicit. <laughs> 
It was called the White Falcon, the falcon being Anne's heraldic badge and a symbol of grace, purity and fertility. This white falcon, rare and precious, this bird shineth so bright. Of all that are, no bird compare, may with this falcon white. Of body small, of power regal she is, and sharp of sight. In chastity excelleth she, most like an angel bright. That she may bring fruit according for such a falcon white. Herself repose upon the rose, now may this falcon white. The symbolism is clear. As king and queen, Henry and Anne were expected to produce a male heir. Under such pressure, Anne's increasing desperation began to show. Less than a year after Elizabeth's birth, rumours circulated that the queen was once again of a goodly belly. But mysteriously, there's no record of either a miscarriage or indeed a birth. Well, it suggests to me that maybe it was a case of pseudosiasis or phantom pregnancy, which happened particularly in the 16th century before the age of scans or pregnancy tests, when women who desperately wanted to be pregnant would have all the symptoms of pregnancy, but there was no baby. Which expresses just how much Anne was desperate to give Henry what he wanted. Henry's obsession wasn't the only burden on their marriage. There were still many Roman Catholics who refused to accept Anne as their queen. This conflict would lead to bloodshed. paid a heavy price to marry Anne Boleyn. In removing the Pope's authority over England, he had made Catholic enemies at home and abroad. To protect his own position, the king needed the loyalty of his subjects, and he was prepared to create new laws and use force to get it. In 1534, Henry's government passed the Act of Supremacy, which said that Henry was and always had been Supreme Head of the Church of England. They just hadn't noticed it recently. And following on the heels of that was the Act of Succession. This said that Anne was his lawful queen and any children they had would be the true heirs to the throne. And all English subjects were required to swear that this was the case. And some people found this very hard to swallow. Those that refused to swear the oath were treated as traitors. This is Charterhouse in central London. In the 16th century, it was a flourishing monastery, and at its head was Prior John Houghton. He would pay the ultimate price for defying Henry. Houghton and many of his monks refused to swear that oath of succession. And so in April 1535, 10 of them were taken to Newgate prison. And within fewer than three weeks, they were tried, convicted, and executed for treason. And we have an astonishing account of their execution. A foreign report on the gruesome event was graphic. What it said was this, they were dragged to the place of execution in their habits to the great grief of the people. They were hanged, cut down before they were dead, opened, and their bow and hearts burned. Their heads were then cut off and their bodies quartered. And another report adds the shocking detail that the executioner caused them to be ripped up in each other's presence, their arms torn off, their hearts cut out, and rubbed upon their mouths and faces. And the barbarity of this act was blamed directly on the King of England himself. <laughs> 
Far from easing the pressure on Henry and Anne's marriage, the deaths of these dissenters only amplified it. They needed a son more than ever to justify their actions. But even though their relationship was under great strain, they certainly weren't shown. I've come to a castle in Gloucestershire. It's a place that reminds us that for more than two years, they were happily married and still in love. The royal couple came here for 10 days in the summer of 1535, just a few months after the bloodshed at Charterhouse. Today, it's an upmarket hotel. Hello. Hello, welcome to Thornbury Castle. Thank you. Uh, my name's Lipscomb. I've got the keys to a unique hotel room. Now, it's pretty unusual to stay in any room that a king and queen have slept in, but one that Henry and Anne have stayed in is a rare and thrilling experience. Of course, it's hard enough to know what goes on behind closed doors in modern relationships, let alone at a distance of almost 500 years. But what we do know is what other people said about Henry and Anne. And what they said is that Henry and Anne were merry together. In fact, Henry and Anne were described as being merry together more than Henry and his other wives, including throughout the summer and autumn of 1535 when they were staying here. But the other thing we know about their relationship is that it was a relationship of sunshine and storms. They quarreled and they made up. They had fights and then they had ardent reunions. Henry and Anne were now two and a half years into their marriage. And as 1535 drew to a close, all seemed well in their world. Fifteen thirty-six should have been a great year for Henry and Anne. The king was now supreme head of the Church of England, and any son that they had would be the legitimate heir to the throne. And things were looking optimistic on that front because Anne was pregnant again. The couple's good fortune continued with the first major event of that year. On the 7th of January, 1536, Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife, had died after a short illness. In the eyes of Rome and Catholic Europe, Catherine was still the legitimate Queen of England. Her nephew was the Spanish King, Charles V, a serious threat to Henry's reign. On the day his ex-wife died, Henry was busy partying at court. No one could now dispute his marriage to Anne. If there's ever a true victim in this story, it's Catherine of Aragon. She gave more than 20 years of her life to this man who would ultimately discard and humiliate her. Her only crime was her failure to give Henry a healthy son. For that, she was exiled from court and her daughter Mary declared a bastard. As a final humiliation, Catherine was denied a state funeral at St Paul's or Westminster Abbey. Instead, she was buried here at Peterborough Cathedral. I find it quite moving and sad to be here by Catherine's grave. Catholics viewed Catherine as a martyr, and her story is so tragic that people still want to mark her life. Look at all this. People have brought flowers and posies, and the pomegranate, her symbol to remember her by. 
So Catherine remains an inspiration. Henry and Anne treated her with utter contempt. So self-absorbed were they. Ultimately, she would be just another victim of their destructive love affair. Henry had weathered a political and religious storm over his divorce from Catherine. Now Anne was expecting a child that would surely be a son. Henry appeared to have come through the other side with pride and honour intact. But I believe it was Henry's overwhelming desire to maintain honour that would ultimately destroy the marriage for which he'd fought so hard. Just 17 days after Catherine's death, Henry and Anne's relationship suffered a major blow. Like everyone else in the 16th century, Henry VIII was obsessed with honour. And honour was associated with masculinity, with upholding patriarchy, with controlling one's household and maintaining one's good name. Masculinity was an essential part of kingship. It was vital that Henry excelled over all. He was a champion on the tilt yard, an expert jouster. But his youth and athleticism were fading. And his love for dangerous sports would now prove life-threatening. Henry fell from his horse whilst jousting. He suffered a major blow to the head. The king was reported to be unconscious for over two hours. Such a severe head injury could be partly responsible for the marked change in Henry's personality. He became an increasingly brutal and cruel king. We understand that the young Henry was very different from Henry in the later years of his life. And there are a couple of ideas about why that could be and how his brain might have been involved. If he underwent damage to the frontal lobe of the brain. It's this part here, just behind the forehead. And if he hit the ground very hard, then the front part of the brain could bash against the skull and cause damage to this area. And the reason why that's important is that the frontal lobe here, the biggest lobe of our brain, is the area responsible for our personalities and our behavior. It processes our experiences and makes us the people that we are. And we know that people who have damage to the frontal lobe, it may just exacerbate character traits that they already have. So if they're slightly grumpy, they may, after their injury, be very grumpy. Often people say it's like a completely different person, and so their characteristics change completely. So it's possible that that's what happened to Henry. We also know that the impact of his fall opened up an old ulcer in Henry's left leg, which would never heal. We know that actually Henry's physicians did try to drain his ulcers and they used hot irons, almost like a hot poker, mm. that they pushed into his, le into his ulcer with no anaesthetic. Oh. And that can't have done very much for his temper. And worse was to come. Henry's jousting accident would be blamed for the next disaster to strike at the heart of Henry and Anne's marriage. Less than a week after Henry's near-fatal fall, Anne miscarried. She blamed her miscarriage on her shock at hearing the news of the king's fall. The fetus was three and a half months old, old enough for them to be able to tell that it would have been a boy. <laughs> 
success of Henry and Anne's marriage had always depended on having a son. The Spanish ambassador Eustace Chapuy wrote that Anne had miscarried of her saviour. He believed that the Queen had sealed her fate. Well, we know that Henry was distraught. Reports said that he showed great distress and great disappointment and sorrow at the loss of this child. He's reported to have said, I see that God will not give me male children. Henry had seen his failure to sire a son with his previous wife, Catherine, as a sign that God disapproved of his first marriage. Was the miscarriage a sign that Anne didn't have God's backing either? Following Anne Boleyn's miscarriage, rumours circulated in court that Henry VIII had lost interest in his wife. Anne was never a popular queen, and without a son, she was exposed to those at court who would rejoice at her downfall. And they would have been delighted to hear gossip that Henry was seeing another woman. Our evidence comes from the Spanish ambassador Eustace Chapuy a wily character and a staunch Roman Catholic who never disguised his hatred for Anne, the woman whom he called the concubine. El Ubaldino writes that he has heard in France that Anna Boulan had in some way or other incurred the royal displeasure and that she is in disgrace with the king who is paying his court with another lady and that the people are uttering words of much indignation against Anne. The other lady that Chapuy refers to is Jane Seymour. Jane was a lady in waiting to the Queen, just as Anne had once been to Catherine. The Spanish ambassador wrote that Henry had sent a letter to Jane, accompanied by a purse full of sovereigns. It was possibly a summons to his bedroom. Jane didn't open the letter and instead sent back the purse and the letter saying that she was the daughter of good and honourable parents and that if the king wanted to make her a present of money, perhaps he'd do so at the time that God decided to give her an advantageous marriage. It does look a little like Jane is playing hard to get. Perhaps because she hoped that the advantageous marriage would be with Henry himself. But I don't believe Henry was planning to marry Jane. It was normal practice for kings at this time to have mistresses, and there's absolutely no evidence that Henry was thinking of abandoning Anne, or indeed that he'd even fallen out of love with her. In fact, Henry was still increasing pressure on the Spanish king, Charles V, to recognize Anne as his queen. But then fate intervened delivering a blow so powerful that it would tear Henry and Anne's relationship apart. Scandalous rumours began to spread through the court that the Queen had been having sexual relations with other men, some close to the King. Why these allegations surfaced and who was behind them is still fiercely debated. Was she guilty of the charges against her? Were the dark forces behind the scenes plotting her downfall? Was Anne the victim of court gossip? Did careless talk cost lives? We know that Anne could be feisty and sometimes even flirtatious, but it's extremely doubtful that Anne would commit adultery. Frustratingly, we don't have the evidence to give us a clear picture of what was going on. But perhaps we can understand Anne's downfall through a more recent royal scandal. Former courtier Patrick Jefferson was Princess Diana's private secretary. I think there are some parallels with Diana there, where some of her critics, uh, some of them quite close to, to the royal establishment, have tried to paint her as a loose cannon. Whereas the truth was, she was a extremely dutiful princess, 
Well, Diana was painted as this woman who had many lovers and was, of course, as well. And it's extraordinary to me that 500 years later, the way you can really blacken a woman's name is to suggest that she's some sort of sexual predator. I think they were both very sassy women and you can't sass around in court and not expect to, uh, to bear the consequences sooner or later. When your usefulness has been outlived, then you better watch out. In other words, they would find anything they could to condemn her in the eyes of the world. It seems to be at the heart of this question about Henry and Anne is the question of scandal. Um, and of course you have been in, in a court that had a certain amount of scandal <laughs> associated with it. Well, I mean, what can we learn from that? Scandal is one way in which courtiers or those who make their living from the court are able to sort out their own pecking order. And when scandal doesn't exist, then there will always be somebody around to create it. And I think the extraordinary thing about Henry is my conviction is that he does genuinely believe that she's committed adultery. Because there would be nobody who wanted to keep their head on their shoulders who was going to tell him he got it wrong. And this is why today I think it is still the case that to give advice to a royal person, let alone tell a royal person they're getting it wrong, that's quite an art. And I don't know how many people have got that art or want to exercise it. There is nobody, I think, today who will tell senior members of the royal family that they're getting it wrong. According to one account, when rumors of Anne's infidelity reached Henry, he was shocked and his color changed. He immediately ordered an investigation into the allegations. Arguably the most damaging and hurtful of these involved adultery and treason with one of the king's oldest friends, Henry Norris. Norris was a gentleman of Henry VIII's privy chamber and a groom of the stall, a role that traditionally entailed wiping the royal bottom. In reality, it meant that Norris was Henry's closest companion, someone he truly trusted. But in Henry's court, walls had ears. No one was immune from the deadly consequences of rumor and gossip. In an indiscreet conversation, the Queen was said to have asked Norris why he hadn't got married yet. And when he replied that he would tarry a time, Anne said, You look for dead men's shoes. For if aught came to the King but good, you would look to have me. In other words, you want to marry me when my husband's dead, don't you? Norris's response, that he'd rather his head were off, suggests he knew that they'd committed a serious faux pas. They had imagined the king's death, which under the Treasons Act was illegal. Henry launched an investigation into Norris's conduct, along with many others who were suspected of having had sexual intercourse with the queen, among them her own brother, George. <laughs> Anne's final downfall was swift and sudden. It began with what should have been a day of celebration for the king and queen at Greenwich Palace. It was May Day, they were at a tournament. They were having a very nice time until some unwelcome news arrived for Henry. It turned out that a musician who'd been interrogated, possibly under torture, had confessed to sexual intercourse with Anne on three occasions. It's my opinion that Henry believed the accusations, and they had the power to destroy his masculine honor, something he valued more than his love for Anne. Henry couldn't be seen as a king who had no control over his wife. He abruptly left Greenwich, taking Norris with him, and whatever was said on that journey back to London was enough to convince Henry that his closest friend was guilty too. Norris would end up on the scaffold. Henry would never see Anne again. She would never have a chance to meet her husband, to talk it through, to give her side of the story, to protest her innocence. That same night, alone at Greenwich Palace, Anne was given all the usual attention of a queen. She was still completely unaware that her life was unravelling. 
Early in the morning on the 2nd of May, Anne was taken from Greenwich to the tower by barge. She had no idea why. She could never have imagined that she was experiencing her final moments of freedom. She travelled in through this water gate in St Thomas's Tower, now known as Traitor's Gate. In those days, the Thames came up all the way to these stairs. And of course, we have this sense, with hindsight, that that was the beginning of the end, that she must have known it was all up. But Anne wouldn't have known that. No one considered for an instant that a Queen of England might lose her head. Sometime after arriving at the royal apartments at the tower, Anne was accused of a long list of sexual crimes and treasonous acts. We don't know how the news was broken to her or how she reacted. Henry, meanwhile, simply disappeared from public life, no doubt wanting to escape the hurt and embarrassment that his wife's trial would bring. I'm walking where the royal apartments used to be, where kings and queens stayed the night before their coronation, because to hold the tower was to hold London and was to indicate that you really held England. And of course, it was where Anne stayed on the night before her coronation and again on the night before her execution. It was also the site of the Great Hall, which held 2,000 people and where Anne's trial was held. Anne's trial took place in front of 2,000 people, and she was judged by a jury of peers led by her own uncle, the Duke of Norfolk. Surviving documents from the trial reveal some of the more salacious accusations levelled at Anne. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing these. This document is an extraordinary one because it is a record of that trial. This is the indictment. This is the charges laid out against Anne. It says, for example, that Anne has diabolically seduced these men because of her frail and carnal appetites, because of her lust. It doesn't stop here. It goes on and on. Over here, it describes Anne's relationships with these various men. So it mentions here, for example, Henry Norris, and says that he has violated and carnally known the Queen. And then it mentions George Boleyn, Anne's brother. And this bit's particularly lurid. It says that she has allured the said George into putting his tongue in her mouth, and she has put her tongue in his mouth. This is a picture of Anne as sexual predator. And that's exactly how Henry wanted her to appear. No man could possibly keep control of a wife with such a depraved sexual appetite, not even the king. Henry was conspicuous by his absence from the trial. It was a tactic that completely rebounded on him. Henry stayed away because it was really humiliating for him to have his wife accused of adultery. It suggested at this time his lack of sexual dominance, his lack of sexual prowess. And indeed, that's precisely what came out of the trial. George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, Anne's brother, was given a piece of paper that he was told not to read out loud. But he did. And on it was the charge that he and Anne had laughed at the king's manner of dressing, had laughed at his terrible poetry, and above all, that Anne had said that the king was not skillful in copulating with a woman and had neither vigor nor potency. Remember, that's in front of that crowd of 2,000. Henry was right to stay away. Anne was convicted on all counts. She now had just three days to live. The outcome of Anne Boleyn's trial was never in doubt. By a jury loyal to the king, she was unanimously found guilty of adultery, incest and high treason.
Sentenced to death and with nothing to lose, it was now Anne's chance to tell her side of the story. I am entirely innocent of all these accusations, so I cannot ask pardon of God for them. I have been always a faithful and loyal wife to the King. I've not perhaps at all times shown him that humility and reverence that his goodness to me and the honour to which he raised me did deserve. In some ways, Anne's trial speech is entirely straightforward. She says that she is innocent, that she has always been a loyal wife to the king. But then there's that curious line about not having shown him the humility and reverence that his goodness to her and the position to which he raised her justified. In other words, she's admitting that actually she's been a bit feisty, that perhaps she's spoken back, she's been out of line from time to time. She hasn't always been the wife that Henry wanted her to be. I confess. I have had fancies and suspicions of him. Which I had not strength nor discretion to resist. But God knows. And as my witness, I have never failed otherwise towards him and I shall never confess any otherwise. Anne claimed, both before and after taking the communion, that she was innocent, on peril of her soul's damnation. And I think she was. I also don't think there's any evidence to sustain the idea that Henry wanted to get rid of her. In fact, I think what happened to Anne was a terrible mishap, that actually Anne managed to look guilty when she wasn't. Her sophisticated conversational wit, her excellence at the courtly game, was where she came unstuck. Exactly what had beguiled Henry in the first place made her look guilty as sin. So like a Shakespearean tragedy, the king, feeling betrayed and hurt, sentenced the queen that he loved to death for crimes she didn't commit. <laughs> I think that the concubine's little bastard, Elizabeth, will be excluded from the succession. And that the king will get himself requested by parliament to marry. The joy shown by the people every day, not only at the ruin of the concubine, but at the hope of Princess Mary's restoration is inconceivable. While Anne awaited her execution in her chambers at the tower, she may well have heard the commotion outside as the five men she was accused of sleeping with, including her brother, were beheaded. I can't begin to imagine how she must have felt. We can't be certain. But it is believed that this is the prayer book that Anne had with her in the tower. I've spent a lot of time thinking about Anne's weeks in the tower, how she racked her brains, how she tried to figure out what had got her into that mess, the hysteria, the trauma, the terrible times she must have had. And the idea that she had this with her at the time and that I'm now holding it in my hands is something I can't quite express. This is the wonder of history, this tangible sense of reaching out to touch the past. And what's even more extraordinary about it is that Anne has written in it. Now, she probably wrote this some time before her execution, but what she wrote has a haunting resonance. It says, Remember me when you do pray that hope doth lead from day to day. Remember me when you do pray that hope doth lead from day to day. And she signed it, 
aanbelen. Anne left her chambers at the tower a little before eight o'clock in the morning. Awaiting her at the end of this short journey was an expert French swordsman summoned by Henry as an act of mercy. For a dignified execution befitting a queen, a scaffold had been erected inside the walls of the tower, away from the public. An eyewitness reported Anne's final words. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die. For according to the law, and by the law, I am judged to die. Therefore, I shall speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, or to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king and send him long to reign over you all. For a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never. And to me, he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus, I take my leave of this world and of you all. And I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul to Christ. I commend thee. Jesus received my soul. O oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul. To receive my soul. Oh Lord God, bless you. The Queen of England was beheaded with a single clean strike of the French blade. This is the Chapel Royal of St. Peter at Vincula, a parish church within the walls of the Tower of London. After Anne was executed, she was brought here to be buried, or at least most of her was. If they did what they did with other traitors, they would have taken her head, boiled it, tarred it, and put it on a spike on London Bridge before throwing it into the swirling Thames. But the rest of her is here, somewhere beneath my feet, and this is where she should be remembered. <laughs> 